Hello and good morning, Stephanie. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you? Absolutely fantastic. I wish I had this book when I was a kid. This this book is just uh, just unbelievable. <laughs> just unbelievable. Oh, thank you so much. What, what's so fascinating about this book is that the imagination of, of a young adult and or child, they're going to understand this because they've been surrounded by computers their entire life. Whereas when I was a kid, a computer to me was a calculator. <laughs> Absolutely. I think a lot of the stuff is a lot easier for them to grasp uh, than it is for us to grasp. So to prepare for tomorrow, I mean, this involves science and it also involves the creative mind because people have got to be visionaries. And that's what you introduce in the ultimate book of the future from National Geographic Kids. Yeah, there are so many people, um, a lot of them young people coming up with just amazing ideas. Um, There's an invention in this book. Uh, created by a kid that is uh, able to sort of pick up trash from our oceans. And so I think that, you know, I hope that this book inspires kids who are reading this to maybe come up with some inventions of their own to change their own futures. Did you feel like a kid when you were putting this book together? You know, I have been writing for kids for 12 years now, and I pretty much always feel like a kid. Um I think I have a kid level curiosity in the world and I'm just constantly amazed by the incredible things that people all over the place are doing. <laughs> one, one of the things that you cover in this robotics, bionics, space travel, H- how do we keep their minds activated? Because I mean, we, we live in this, this ADD world or, or Twitter speak as I always call it, because people only want so much of, of the story. They don't want to, you know, to play it all out. Can we get to these robotics, bionics and space travel in their time? Oh, absolutely. The idea of this book was, you know, we don't want to talk about technology that's going to maybe happen far away, but what is the world going to look like in maybe the 2050s when kids today are adults? And so pretty much all of the technology is, um, you know, real technology that's in development, a ton of actual working prototypes. Um, Flying cars is a great example. That's been something that you know, people have been saying is right around the corner for about 100 years now, but now it really is right around the corner. Um, There are a ton of flying cars that are able to fly right now and um, a lot of ports for these flying cars that are in development. So um, that is one piece of future technology that I feel really confident predicting that kids are absolutely going to see in the near future. And there's a lot more of that. It, it might be my age, but I, I still sit here and I look at electric cars going, how, why would I buy a car that only goes 300 miles? I mean, that, that, uh, like I said, it's probably my age. And where are they charging these things up? How are we going to fly cars if I can't see these, these, these places where people are recharging their cars? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I, I, I think you're right. I think it is really, really hard to imagine. Um, but I think, you know, there's 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 a difference between everybody having a technology, right? You know, although we do see so many people have electric cars and can charge them right in their garages mm-hmm. now. Um, and, but there's a difference between everybody having something and, and something, you know, coming out. Not everyone is going to have flying cars right away. Um, we're going to see them more uh, in specific routes. So, for example, one of the, the earliest routes is probably going to be Uh, between Manhattan and John F. Kennedy Airport. That trip now takes about an hour. And uh, with the flying car ports that are in development, it'll hopefully take about six minutes. Wow. Wow. One of the stories that I can relate with, uh, the cutting edge stories with training doctors with virtual reality, and the reason why I can relate with it is, well, it's not because I'm a doctor, but because I teach broadcasting to students in in the Southeast here, they're, they're going to the metaverse. They're, we're going to be teaching people around the world through the metaverse when it comes to broadcasting. I am so into doing what you're writing about here. Yeah, uh, doctors being able to practice virtual surgeries before they do the real thing is um, a super cool piece of technology. And there already are robotic patients that, um, that will cry and bleed and sweat, um, experience pain that doctors can practice on. But like you're saying, I'm sort of entering the metaverse and 
being able to uh, interact with virtual patients and kind of perfect their skills before they do it on a real human is uh, a really exciting piece of technology. What's really scary, though, are, are the robots that are that are going to be artists. I mean, because I am an artist, I do have um, artwork out there. And, and what about all of these these famous pieces of artwork? If a computer is going to do artwork, they, they can do it by the billions. And doesn't that make it not, not necessarily priceless? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a piece of the future that we're going to have to see how that plays out. Um, I mean, there already is uh, is robot art being done. Um, uh, I think the first piece of robot art sold for, or, or a, a recent piece of robot art sold for about $400,000. Wow. Um, but that might be the novelty of it. And when there's a ton of AI-generated art, uh, that novelty might kind of wear off. Um, I would say that the robot art now is not generally super impressive. So I don't know if that's something that we have to worry about quite just yet. One of the things that we're, we've been experiencing over the past 10 years are holograms. And, I mean, the group ABBA is putting an entire tour together where you'll be able to see them up on stage. I mean, they did it with Buddy Holly. We, I, when, when I saw Queen in concert, they had Freddie Mercury up there on stage. This is really getting good, this hologram stuff. It is amazing. I mean, you truly can hardly tell the difference. Kind of scary, though. But I love it, though, because, I mean, I, I would love to go to an Elvis Presley concert. And if, 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 if that's him on stage and that's the, what his hologram is doing, I'll, I'll still enjoy it. Yeah, I think there are some people like that who think it's a really cool opportunity to see a quote-unquote live performance of someone iconic. Um, and then there are other people who think that maybe we should leave the past in the past. Um, you know, I think it just depends on your on your perceptions. But but like you said, holographic performances, they're happening, whether whether uh, everyone likes them or not. Would you say that and, and kids are going to understand this because they're living it with the rest of us. Would you say that COVID-19, the vaccine, was actually a vision that someone had several years ago that became the vaccine today? Somebody had to plant that science before we could have what we have today. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, decades of research backed up what uh, has now become the COVID vaccine. And um, there are, I think it's hard to, they never could have predicted uh, that that technology would be used exactly the way that it was. Um, but there are so many people developing tech like that, that, that will be used in sort of unexpected ways. And um, I think that's one of the exciting things about the future, right, is that we, we can't totally predict it. I'm a huge fan of Star Wars, watching the Obi-Wan Kenobi and stuff like that on Disney+. Plus. But the thing is, though, is I sit there and I can see those droids and how smart they are. Are computers and robots going to become smarter than humans? You know, I think that it depends on how you define smart. You know, we have um, Watson, the robot that famously competed in Jeopardy!, and uh, a robot like that is able to basically memorize all of Wikipedia in a matter of minutes, you know, can input basically the entire uh, collective knowledge of the Internet and be able to access that, which is something that we humans can't do. But robots, um, as advanced as they are, they still, you know, we have robots on other planets, on Mars. They still need human input to operate. And um, there are some people that think that robots are going to outpace us and it's possible to sort of program in human creativity. And there are other experts who think that, uh, no, that human creativity is just like special part of human brain power that robots will never be able to replicate. So, you know, we'll just have to see. So is it, is it robots that, that they're putting in smart clothing? What What is going to make smart clothing that one thing? Because I'm really interested in this. I, I, I want to know what my blood pressure is. I want to know what I'm stressed out. I want to know what my temperature is. And if there's such a thing as smart clothing, I want some of this action. Yeah, I mean, we already kind of have it in some of the high-tech watches that are out there. You know, I think smart clothing is only going to continue to get cooler. There are... Uh, contact lenses in development that you'll be able to sort of use as a camera. You can blink and they'll take a picture. Wow. There are um, solar powered jackets that will be able to heat you up when you're cold, keep you warm. Um, there are even uh, clothing in development that contains special microscopic structures to keep them clean. Um, when they're exposed to light, the structures release a burst of, a burst of energy that will break down <laughs> 
you know, that errant ketchup stain that you get on them. Um, and, you know, the idea of never having to do laundry again, I think, is pretty appealing. I, I want young readers and adult readers to read your story about, about could it happen? Because, I mean, this is Jurassic Park's big return to the big screen this weekend. And you've got a story in here about the woolly mammoth. My God, if that woolly mammoth comes back, is that really going to be a big positive thing? Um, it depends on how you look at it, like all of this stuff. Um, but there is a guy who is famously working on bringing woolly mammoths back oh by God. sort of um, genetically, yeah, genetically altering elephants, which are not too far removed from woolly mammoths, to bring back some of those woolly mammoth characteristics, like the long fur. Um, that's something that we have the technology to do, so it is technically possible. Is it a great idea? That just depends on your perception. This is a brilliant book. I, I'm so proud of you guys for doing this. And, and this is one of those books that I have to put away and come back to in 10 or 15 years because I, I want to see how it all changed. I just I just love what you guys, it brings out the kid in me and it also makes it fun to be an adult. Oh, that's so nice to hear. Please come back to this show anytime in the future. Stephanie, the door is always going to be open for you. I appreciate that. Will you be brilliant today, okay? <laughs> okay, thanks.